This episode, I'm joined by Jason Josephson Storm, who is a professor of Japanese religions and European intellectual history. In this episode, we discuss his book, The Myth of Disenchantment, alongside discussions on world religions, belief in the modern world, and the idea of modernity being disenchanted, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast, because it is very much appreciated, please find links in the description below, alongside links for joining our community. Enjoy. So, Jason Joseph from Storn, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are going to be discussing your book, which was published in 2017, which is called The Myth of Disenchantment, Magic, Modernity, and the Birth of the Human Sciences. So, um, sort of, I was joking with Jason just before we started that anyone who's sort of been listening to me for a while knows I harp on about the modern world and modernity and how it's, uh, like, disenchanted and everyone's, like, lost the spirit and everyone's these sort of automatic drones caught in this weird probably renaissance type of magic uh going off a lull and McLuhan or whoever along these lines and the Greer's idea Greer's idea of like getting caught up in the modernity trap and then here I find this book called the myth of disenchantment which is like okay this guy he's gonna disprove everything um and it you know it does a really good job of basically to to you know to a degree proving that yeah this is all a myth and this idea of enchantment is really how we conceptualize it um and there's clearly a lot more going on than that typical oh we're in the modern world like this is all we've got this sterile environment there's there's far more to it than that which is, should should come as no uh, 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 as no surprise but there you go. Well, and I think also, like, I think the fact that the recent history, you know, of the history of the 20th century, the 19th century, it leaves a lot of people really unhappy. And so the sense that the world is itself um, disenchanting is often what motivates the very things that undo that disenchantment. So it's more contested than periodized. So, you know, what I wanted to emphasize in the book is just that, um, you know, there's been a, a, a long history of contestation and struggle, and there have always been these persistent countercurrents. People have been interested in spirits, in belief in you know magical powers, or or in in mystical you know practices, quote unquote, or what have you. Um, and what happens in the 19th and 20th century is that the sort of public status of some of those beliefs may change, but the beliefs themselves and they may transform, but they don't they don't actually go away. And I think that there's a misrecognition built into the idea of modernity that, it, that things kind of vanish. So um, if you're feeling embattled in our present moment, you're not alone. So I'm definitely not trying to uh, say that, you know, um, there, there are no reason you know, that, that everything is peachy and that we should just, uh, you know, uh, accept the status quo or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's already a big question there that, you know, you're putting forward the idea that when modernity makes it like, makes it seem like these things, uh, you know, aren't around anymore. And of course, perhaps we'll get this quite, get to this question later, but there's a big question there of whether or not it's actively trying to do that. And if so, why is it, you know, what's it, what's it trying to promote in favor of that? But before we get to that, um, the, how did this book come about? You know, what, where did this sort of arise from? Um, so about a decade ago, so I know you sent me questions and I meant to write up more formal answers to them. I'm just going to wing it. Um, so, uh, uh, although I have a few notes, um, well, let me start that over. So about a decade ago, um, I was in Japan and I was doing some research. I wrote my first book about, uh, from, about Japanese intellectuals encountering the terms religion, science, magic for the first time in the 19th century and trying to figure out how to translate those terms. If there was anything in Japan that was analogous to religion, was there an indigenous science? Was there, what was this weird word magic, etc.? I'd written that book and it was uh, on its way out. Um, and I was doing some follow-up research about contemporary belief in talismans and ghostly premonitions in Japan. Um, and I was there uh, during the um, tsunami and Fukushima uh, accident and disaster, which was really terrible. Um, but uh, I was in the other part of Japan. I was in uh, Kyoto when that happened. And in that context, uh, just by chance, uh, the day that that happened, I was getting some touch-ups on some tattoos in a tattoo parlor. And, um, you know, people started talking, you know, once we, we heard about the tsunami and, you know, the, the people doing the tattooing 
put it up on the screen and and it sort of transformed the situation from merely tattoo artist and patron into a bunch of people just hanging out trying to talk about what was happening and one of the uh dudes in the tattoo parlor asked me well what brought you to japan and why are you here and i told him about that research project and there was one other western dude one other european um dude there uh i think he was uh, from maybe norway or something and um when he heard about me researching the supernatural he was like oh you know japan is so special you still have these belief people believe in ghosts you still people who believe in powers um it's not like in the west where nobody believes you know where he came from where he says nobody believes in any of that stuff it's totally disenchanted and that bothered me because i knew that lots of people in the west believed in many similar kinds of things to people in contemporary japan and i thought that he was you know not unique but a lot of people had this kind of orientalized idea of a mystic asia where people still believe in magic but a west where people don't and i just didn't think that that was true and between the collapse of my research archive, like I couldn't go to to, to Tokyo to do research because the city was basically shut down. Um, and the fact that I, I realized that trying to focus on sort of um, contemporary enchanted belief in Japan <clears throat> reinforced a mystic Asia. I decided, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to Germany instead. And an opportunity opened up for me to do that. I went to Germany and I started thinking and reading through the archive of European philosophical thought. And with attention to references to magic, enchantment, and other things. And I noticed it was all over the place, whether it's Freud writing about, you know, his own belief in telepathy, or whether it's Schopenhauer actually providing what is literally a theory of magic, or, you know, whatever, um, you know, or Deleuze and his early interest in um, esoteric practices, Western esotericism, so-called. Um, it just was all over the place. And, and with that in mind, I kind of ended up doing a research project where it took me, instead of in archives in Japan, I wandered around Western Europe looking at archives in uh, Germany, Austria, Great Britain and France, and looking at mostly di diaries and letters of these famous people and their own kind of beliefs in um, magical and occult practices. So, yeah, the other piece I would add is that I partially knew that people still believed in that stuff because my grandmother was a famous anthropologist who, quote unquote, went native uh, on the Puaca Reservation in New Mexico and had come to believe in spirits and had become a part of her major thing was was the, sort of both the anthropological credibility, but also her her um version of spirit practices and you know my grandmother was my hero and growing up i would go uh to spend summers with her on the reservation and um people from all over europe and and the united states often academics came and did practices with her and i knew that it, it was in their private lives even if it wasn't in their public lives and so um that experience is part of also why i you know try to do this research yeah uh, okay okay i mean thinking just jumping back to that, you mentioned the split between, you know, the the mystical East and the sort of analytical, cold, calculated West. Do you think there's ever been a time when that's been true? No, I don't think that's ever been true. And and also, I think that the whole line, the idea that you can split human civilizations into East and West uh, always is weird and anachronistic. So, you know, like... Francis Bacon, for example, he starts, uh, you know, the, the this idea of he's sometimes called the, the patron or the godfather of modern science. And when he's making some of his first arguments for the advancement of learning, he's like, you know, here are the things that modern learning will get you. It'll get you gunpowder. It'll get you the compass. and It'll get you the printing press. Europeans didn't invent gunpowder, the compass or the printing press. A lot of those were, you know, China, at least for, for gunpowder and the printing press. And so and there's been a lot of flows um, between what we think of as Europe and Asia, um, you know, they're, they're for, for, for all of recorded history, basically. Um, and those flows have not been all equal directional and they haven't been, they've been disrupted at various points. But the idea that there's like a line where you say, okay, here's the Bosporus and on the other side of it, people are mystical and, you know, on this side of it, people are rational or whatever. That doesn't make any sense. It's, an, it's never held true. Um, and so it both, that both tends to undersell the kind of magical beliefs in the West and undersell the kind of analytical beliefs in so-called the East. And so, you know, that's why I'm trying to sort of collapse those two as a kind of bifurcated category. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the split will probably come, come back in, but I do have to, before we go any further, I have to ask you the Hamidics question, um, which I'm, you know, sometimes I think it will probably be fairly clear, but your book touches on so many people that it you know i have no clue who you're going to pick so you can place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the conversation who do you pick and we're assuming they can speak to each other yeah, regardless of language yeah, yeah yeah um let's see i would i mean I'm, i'll just go super 
old school. I'll say the Buddha, Socrates, and Jesus. I mean, I mean, art. I mean, especially you know, I would be uh, uh, the first two. I mean, I would love to have uh, a sense of Buddhist. I think. There are so many parallels between early Greek philosophical thought and early Indian and South Asian philosophical thought. And one of the things that if I had an alternate career to do over uh, and assuming that there were more sources, what I would be really interested in are the knowledge flows between classical Greek antiquity and classic Indian antiquity, because I think that there are a lot of things that got transmitted um, in in that period. Perhaps Puranic skepticism may really have come in some ways from South Asia or maybe not, but there's tantalizing references. I think, you know, references in Clement of Alexandria to the Buddha, you know. So I think that there's been a lot more flows. And I think that also with the intermediary position of places like Jerusalem in the Middle East, there, there are just all these things that, that, that have been exchanged that we don't know about because we don't have the archival sources to prove. But we can sort of see certain kinds of, of parallels. And I would love to, you know, and not only would these be the some of the most wise, powerful, you know, thinkers in the in the history of the planet, but I'd be curious to know too, you know, do they recognize each other? Do they in some fundamental sense, you know, do they see similarities of ideas and thought or praxis or something like that? Yeah. Do you do you think Socrates and, and Buddha would, would get on? Or do you I think, think that Socrates they would be sort of prodding him. I think he'd be prodding, and but I think the Buddha would would enjoy it because I think the Buddha had a similar kind of prodding, uh, uh, you know, sort of skepticism too, um, although in different praxis. And so I think that's where they would kind of split. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, perhaps that's. I mean, that's a clear room because you know there's no there's no really need to explain why you'd want to meet those three. They're like the big yeah. three. You'd hopefully come out a bit a bit wiser as well. And humbled, I'm sure, you know, I'd probably be like, oh, my God, you know, whatever, you know, something. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. OK, well, maybe they'll come back in. Maybe they'll come back in. But we have to start somewhere with this book, which is sort of like encyclopedic, which is quite nice about it. One nice thing about it, that there's so many sources, so many references um, that it isn't just pulling off, you know, the, the few things which is often brought up about sort of enchantment in relation to philosophy, because as you say, everywhere you look. Uh, in the history of philosophy and I'm, it just still amazes me that there hasn't been sort of a collection of texts written sort of like the history of philosophy in relation to magic because there doesn't seem to be any you know philosopher who is known who hasn't had at some point some relationship with magic right or or, or yeah. mysticism in some sense and you know it's it's always amazed me like where this that history has gone um but perhaps there's a reason for that but i mean a good place to begin i think is the if we go back to that sort of split, we have mysticism on one side and we have, you know, science on the other. And I spoke to someone recently, I spoke to a philosopher called Rico Schneller recently who sort of emphasized this idea that science sort of originally was natural science, which was more encompassing of mystical elements or things, you know, telepathy, things along these lines. And then it sort of split off into science. And do you think that this this split, this clear split where they have one methodology in science and they're very sort of hostile towards mysticism has been fairly damaging towards our understanding of, of both sides. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll take a step back and I'll do what I normally tend to do, which is get kind of meta. I mean, I know it can be an annoying, um, annoying habit, but, but here I, I'm interested in how rather than essentializing science and saying science is one thing, what I'm really interested in is how the, a, a constellation of different kinds of practices and terms got gelled together and knit together under that term science. And so, you know, so, so for readers who, who might not know this, um, you know, the term science uh, enters English in um, roughly the 12th century as a synonym for knowledge. It's just the Latin scientia knowledge. And it originally meant um, an Aristotelian notion of logically demonstrable and certain truth based on reasoning from first principles. So it didn't mean empirical investigation. In fact, it was the opposite of empirical investigation. It wasn't experiments. It was logical necessity. You know, it was maybe math, you know, or something like that, geometry and math. Um, and then, but then there's this big flip with Newton um, in where Newton and, and his associates start to, to use this term science to give prestige to something that how, you know, experimental practice, which was as associated with alchemy as it was with anything else, right? It's the, uh, the chemics, you know, chimia and, and stuff like that. Um, and that led toward a very only, only over a long period of time to gelling together a notion of a category of science as distinct from philosophy. And that doesn't happen until the mid 19th century. And even our word scientist in English is, um, you know, Will, William Ewell, who has a weirdly spelled name, but anyway, we will, um, Ewell. Um, and that's, you know, um, mid 19th century. And 
in that moment, you start to have an attitude toward things like science. And it's the moment where you first start to hear about things like a split between science and religion and the idea that the two are antagonistic. But that's not taken for granted by people even then and much less today. Um, you start to have the formulation of these different discursive terrains, but there's always this hybridization and interplay. So in the moment where science is being invented, let's say, as a its own autonomous, semi-autonomous system, it, it included things like often spiritual practices, which were seen as spiritual sciences or you know, the word psychology, which is, you know, from CK, which means soul, you know, and, and positioned itself as a psychology, you know, as a science of the soul or what have you. There's, you know, in that same moment, there's there's all this interplay and, and, and intersection. And so I tend to not think of science as a, as a unity. I think of it as a grab bag of different kinds of knowledge making practices. And I think as a insofar as I do philosophy and history of science, I'm also the chair of a science and technology studies program. I like to break down the idea of a unity of science. That doesn't mean that science isn't one thing. There's like not one scientific method. There's not one set of scientific practices um, that that are shared by biology and astronomy, much less, you know, with physics. And then if you add in, um, you know, a bunch of other things in there, like, I don't know, political science, which, you know, uses the word science and name it, you know, that's something way, way different. But even in the natural sciences, there's not one method. And so what, what ends up happening is that what we call science tends to be, um, you know, a set of disciplinary norms, a set of common practices, maybe uh, a set of ideals, but nothing so rigid or, or fundamental as a, as a unitary form of knowledge. But in the in the, but rhetorically science gets a lot of prestige and it becomes this huge fight over what gets to fit in it is phrenology science is psychology science is you know are the social sciences sciences is you know is there was a huge debate is geology science at the beginning of the of the 19th century um so the, the, so it becomes a prestige category. And one of the things that happens in the process of becoming a prestige category is that uh, people start to exclude things as a way to gain gain prestige. And so, you know, and, and it turns out that the enemies of things that are assigned as, as pseudoscience or counterscience are often those very zones of overlap, which look like things like science and religion or science and mysticism or science and spiritual practice, which were often essential to the scientific enterprise and keep coming back in. You can't seem to keep those things fully out, but the, there's a sort of internal discursive attempt to shed those as a way to um, manifest prestige and to hold on to disciplinary territories and physicists like to, you know, think that they're the pinnacle and then, you know, they're fighting off the, you know, economists who want to claim that they're doing just like physics, but for the social or whatever. And all those various things tend to, um, preclude certain ways of knowing that are um, that even as they, they kind of slip in the back door, even as they're harder to disentangle. I don't know if I actually answered your question so much as took you on a, on a tangent, um, a historicizing tangent. But what I want to suggest is that um, uh, there's a, you know, a lot more openness. So, for example, you know, um, we, we keep historian of science after historian of science keeps trotting out as a matter of surprise the particular preoccupations of one scientific figure after another. Robert Boyle was an alchemist. Newton was a last of the magicians, quote unquote. Um, uh, but even more, Wolfgang Pauli was a mystic. Uh, quantum theorists have long been interested in Eastern thought. There is a reason that when Oppenheimer dropped the bomb, he quoted quoted from you know the Bhagavad Gita, "I have become death, destroyer of worlds." All those zones of interplay have have been happening repeatedly. You know, it's not it's less exception than um, than it is the rule. You know, the exception are the people who are like, oh, I, I can only do you know this thing and I don't have a private life um, otherwise. And in that respect, one of the, the, the things that many scientists have tried to do is extend the arguments of science into terrain that is fraught or contested. So, you know, Madame Curie was doing seances or whatever, trying to figure out if she could find scientific evidence for the existence of spirits. Um, and then, you know, ended up inconclusive. Uh, but, you know, that's, you know, so I think there's been a lot more, if you look at it from from the vantage that I try and open up in this book, you see a lot more of those crossings and uh, and a lot more entanglement. It becomes much harder to separate science from from other kinds of things. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that it's all bullshit, but does mean that it, <laughs> it uh, it's more it's more rich and it's less uh, less. Less uh, unified than the the myth of science might make you think it is okay is, do you think there's a reason that, that that you know science as it becomes more and more specific and more and more sort of uh you know they they hold themselves in esteem and start ostracizing different things do you think there's a reason that they they generally do keep out those those um facets of education which are seen as more enchanted you know they wish to seem actually quite disenchanted these days do you think there's a reason they 
you know, wish to remain that way? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is this very notion that what it means to be modern is to be disenchanted. And so one of the things that I'm interested in the book is how this notion of modernity um, as disenchantment functions is what I call a regulative ideal, which is to say something that we think other people think. And so we act accordingly. So, you know, uh, you know, the idea is a lot of people, if you do surveys of the United States, for example, about 75 percent of Americans have one form of quote unquote paranormal belief or or, or another, but any given paranormal belief usually has less than 50% uh, believers in it. Many of them only have like 25% or something like that, and they conflict with each other. So somebody might think that, you know, a strong believer in ESP, uh, somebody else might be a strong believer in demons, uh, but they each n think that, you know, that, you know, 75% of other people don't believe in ESP. So they try and keep that in their private life. You know, 75% of other people or no, 40% of other people don't believe in demons. So they try and keep that in their private life or whatever. Um, and they tend to cross each other out. And so I think that's part of what contributes to privatization and further the sense that other people don't believe in any of those things, that illusionary uh, notion that, that we've, you know, entered a rational modernity without uh, that belief tends to uh, encourage people to be private about it or to clean up other disciplinary figures. I mean, there's another piece of it. And, and I have to say um, that after the 1950s, as part of a backlash or reappraisal of the period of the Second World War, there, there became this mistaken idea that occult belief in particular was associated with fascism. That's not to say that, you know, there were no occult Nazis, but most Nazis were not occultists and most occultists were not on the right. So, you know, you have a call belief across the political spectrum. But then I think that it re encouraged people to close down and decrease their, um, or to privatize to a greater extent some of their beliefs, and even to clean up the histories of disciplinary figures. So you can read histories, for example, written in the 30s uh, of philosophy that are more likely to mention strange things that Schopenhauer believed. And then, you know, but by the 50s, they've dropped that from the story of Schopenhauer in order to have him not seem like he's a proto-Nazi or something like that, even though, you know, th th that, that, that connection wasn't a real connection. So I think that's part of it. I mean, um, yeah, I make it keep going, but yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think before we go forward, I mean, especially as you've mentioned it a couple of times, and it's in your title. So I sort of have to ask you that horrible question. What is modernity? How do you define it? Um, so what I think is what I'm interested in is how this particular term, you know, modernity, which comes from, you know, this Latinate word modernus, meaning now. And uh, ironically, it's a term that first enters the English lexicon as a kind of description of architectural styles during what we think of as the Middle Ages. So it's and it actually occurs as a time period periodization before people were medieval. They were talking about themselves as modern. It's a weird contradiction. But medieval is only ever retroactive as a term. I know I get very literal about terms. That's one of the terrible forms of training that we get uh in, in philological forms of the academy. Um, what I'm interested in is how a bunch of stuff gets bundled together under this word modernity. Sometimes the things that get bundled under it are, you know, urbanization, rationalization, increasing literacy, uh, or globalization, or the rise of capitalism. These are not unrelated, but they are not identical. And depending on which one you hold up, um, you're going to have a very different story. And I think the problem with the term modernity is that it surreptitiously bundles these together, included often with the idea of a particular rupture, like a moment when we became modern. And that rupture or moment is totally different depending on which process you really think you have in mind. And even then, it's probably not ruptural. It's probably gradual. But then people think, oh, did modernity start in, I don't know, uh, uh, 1492? Or did it start with the Protestant, you know, 1517? Or did it start in 1868? Or did it start in 1940? Or whatever. There's no agreed upon periodization, but with also the sense of a rupture built into it. Um, and by bundling all those things together, the idea becomes um, that uh, it often makes an actor of the very thing it's trying to explain. So we say modernity does things when really what we mean is, you know, either we mean a time period or we mean a project. And as a project, modernization has always been heterogeneous geographically. So people have always thought, you know, people tend to think of the modern city is always being a different city unless you're complaining about it. So like people in Paris were looking to London and people in London were looking to New York and people in New York were looking to Tokyo and vice versa uh, when they were looking for modernity. And so modernity is one of those things that's often elusive, but a kind of ideal uh, that we often, you know, think, oh, we need to be more modern. Um, and here's how we might want to do it. Um, and, it, and, it and it mostly tended to apply even at its best uh, heterogeneously geographically, you know, it'd be like, oh, well, London is modern, but not, I don't know, Yorkshire or something. I mean, I have no idea, but like even in internal to, 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 the, to, to the geographies of, of Great Britain, a sense that it wasn't evenly distributed. And one of the things I'm interested in doing is untying that bundle, 
And in that respect, um, exposing all the different kinds of things we might want to mean with modernity and how they don't always co-occur or fit, fit the same temporality. And the one in particular that I, that I found troubling is the idea that modernity means disenchantment or a loss of belief in magic. And just because it's just not true. Um, I mean, you know, for reasons that I try and demonstrate in the book in more detail. So I'm not denying that urbanization happened or that, you know, whatever, but, I'm, but it doesn't fit the same chronology or temporalities like, you know, as some of these other patterns. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, perhaps I should just ask you the, the huge question then, but I mean, so even though that we have that term modernity, which is really like this free floating signifier, right? It's like certain people yeah. can take it up for one thing. Certain people can take it up for another. And as you say, it's completely contextual within nations within geographies within even time frames etc so it's like it's just constantly used when it's like we all know what that means but we don't but yeah. we all agree so what, what did you call it a like a a, a regulative ideal so we we all yeah. think that everyone else thinks this is modern but even if that's the case so we sort of have this floating subjective idea of what modernity is there it does seem to be some agreement that it is disenchanted so in what sense is that? I mean, that's the big question of the book. In what sense has that come about that we all, I mean, uh, you know, I'll just play devil, devil's advocate. We sure. all believe that the modern world is disenchanted. What, where has this idea come from? So I think it emerges as a myth, um, as I try and argue in the book, uh, this idea that we've entered a period of disenchantment um, or, or a mythless age emerges first in certain respects in 18th century Germany or, or eight, late 18th, early 19th century Germany uh, in a particular group of, uh, of intellectuals who are having a fight over Spinoza and his reception. Uh, but, it, but, it, but it has implications because a bunch of them, Hegel in particular, but, but you know, others become incredibly famous. And contribute narratives of secularization, which they were, you know, when Hegel first describes what we later call secularization, he's talking about something very specific and, you know, that, that, that you know, happens in and around uh, various pre attempts at German unification and the stripping of clerical statuses, et cetera, et cetera, from a, a very tight moment and tight geography um, in the, in the mid 19th century. But we get out. From Hegel, we get you know secularization. We get Nietzsche talking about the death of God. We get um, we start to get um, Schiller's famous poem *Die Entgottete Natur*, which from which we get versions of the idea of a de-godded nature. Uh, and you know, I mean, that's the phrase from his poem um, *The Gods of uh, the, the Gods of Greek Lands* or *The Gods of Greece*. Um, and we so. And then, and then a little bit later, we get Max Weber and his famous formulation, the Entsabung der Welt, the disenchantment of the world. All of that is in a fairly f short time frame. And it's often are posited by the people who are themselves aiming to resupply the missing piece. So when uh, people like Schiller say, you know, the, the RH has no myth, he's trying to also produce a new myth to replace that. When people like Hegel are saying, um, we've, you know, stripped out uh, uh, religion from philosophy, he's trying to produce a philosophy that's an alternative to religion. In other words, you know, his, you know, or, when, you know, or, or he's describing, a, he describes a rupture between mind and nature only so that the spirit can, can re-overcome that mind, you know, that rupture in his own, own narrative. Um, or uh, for, for, for Max Weber, when he's describing the disenchantment of the world, I mean, he's a little more melancholy about it, but he's hanging out with a bunch of neo-pagans who are themselves trying to resupply the missing magic. And, and Weber knows about them. He just thinks that they're doomed. I mean, he, he's a little more pessimistic. But um, so the other way to put it, though, is that we could go even farther back. And we could note that one of the earliest tropes of magic itself is of its own uh, pastness or fadingness. So already, uh, 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 you know, we see this with narratives of the of the fairies. The fairy fairy farewell is a well recognized folkloric trope that the idea is fairies are always in the past, and that's a trope we've recorded from the very first stories of fairies. So people are always like, oh, the fairies used to be around; they're now mostly gone, but a couple of them come back. Similar things about magic. So people would say, you know someone would present you with a spell book and the spell book would claim to recover lost magic. It's like, this is the lost magic of Moses or whatever. And I'm bringing it to you now. So, you know, magic has often been supposed to be, you know, the, the, the any magical source book gains prestige by presenting itself as the last remnant of a fading phenomena. Uh, and, and the same is true of fairy belief and, and, and other things as well. And so we could almost say, and I don't want to over essentialize, I don't want to say this is always there, but I could say that frequently the, Disenchantment has been one of the central tropes of magic. 
And so therefore, and that precedes, we have, we have this in Chaucer, for example, you know, the fairy farewell appears in Chaucer. We have this way before people start talking about modernity and modernization. And so one of the weird things is when is, is shifting emotional valences rather than shifting narratives. So it becomes, in many cases, we start, people start to celebrate that loss instead of um, merely bemoaning it. Uh, but, but at the same moment that people are condemning a lot of magic, people start to produce it. So, I, I mean, you know, I think it's one of those things that, that, that um, is self-reinforcing. So, you know, and, and we see it if we look at it in terms of the history that there, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that everything has been consistent, uniform, but that we have what we might think of as dialectical movement. So, you know, in the moment when a bunch of people start believing in spiritualism, somebody else starts attacking the belief in spiritualism and then less people believe in spiritualism and then people feel an, a, a lack and then they turn to theosophy and then theosophy starts to come up again and then theosophy gets discredited and then, you know, whatever, then the new age starts to come up, you know. So, I mean, again, it's, you know, I mean, I'm making hand gestures that your listeners won't be able to see, but it's a kind of flowing up and down in, in which which, you know, or dialectical movement in which the opposites keep being produced. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that's that's maybe a resistance to answering your question. But anyway, that's my, no, not, my not way of thinking. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. But I mean, it does sort of bring up a, a clear point with regard to that idea of replacing myths or replacing religion with a philosophy, which then becomes a religion or a myth, which is like the myth that there is no myths or, you know, and we have loads of myths in modernity. So do you think it's exactly do you think it's ever possible to get out? I mean, the, but these are religious frameworks in a way so do you think in a way that 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 floating thing which is modernity in quotation marks is itself a religion which consistently just wants to deny that it is a religion in that traditional sense i mean i, I would say I, I would say i have a little hang-ups on the word religion but i'll, I'll grant I'll, i think it's a myth that consistently wants to insist that it's not a myth i think you're totally right about that and that's the way i would prefer to formulate in the book and you know um but, but i think that's right and i don't think we'll escape myth i think and i don't think that would be a good thing i mean i don't i mean i, I you know i think you know we we all have the, the myths that we live by or whatever to borrow somebody else's title um but you know um we can have better or worse myths. And, and it turns out that, that modernity has been mostly a, either a self-refuting myth or a myth that has justified certain kinds of colonialization or you know internal um, forms of disavowal that I think are psychologically unhealthy, a kind of you know repression that, that, that then gets institutionalized in different ways. So for that respect, I, I'd like, that's a myth that I think we should recognize that we're making up and, and, and hopefully that one will, you know, the myth of a mythless modernity will, will be one of those things we can, we can throw out. Um, yeah. Is that why you're fairly critical of the term the Enlightenment? Because it's it's like just patting itself on the back. Yeah, it's just patting itself on the back. And I mean, I think I say something more specific. Um, I'm just looking at, I will remind myself with my thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, the, the Enlightenment is just like w one of those it, it's a late term. So again, I do this historian thing if I look at anachronisms, but the idea of, of a particular period called the Enlightenment mostly comes out in the 1950s. And it, uh, and it really gets to be a big deal in the English world in the 1980s uh, as conflicting critiques of defenses of it uh, proliferate. So in many respects, the idea that there was one moment where we like gelled this shit together and became, you know, w when philosophy had this unique focus on reason or whatever, and, and you know, is a, is a weird self patting on the back and also an anachronism. So, you know, people like Steven Pinker, for example, want to tell this grand positive story. So about how, like, you know, the, everything became great or whatever. And to do that, he has to, his myth needs it's a story of its own foundation. And the story he wants to give it, it locates in a period called the Enlightenment, where he cherry picks thinkers. And so, you know, he wants to say, oh, this is the moment where everybody, um, celebrated reason or whatever, but he doesn't note that, you know, Kant is project is a critique of the limits of reason that, you know, uh, that um, Rousseau is challenging everything that, that, that Diderot is saying, or that, you know, Diderot himself was also just in the passions that, that Schiller is trying to figure out how to have intellectual growth, growth, but also alongside art, you know, like many of those things are already there in that moment. And, you know, there's a period in which, um, you know, and, and even then they're not using the term the enlightenment, they're using the term enlightenment. And, and for in many respects, that's a term that, that functions the same thing as, as our word science and, and feeds into it. It's a, just a term for knowledge. And so it's, a, you know, for, for a particular style of knowledge. Um, but yeah, so I think then you get this weird notion that um, there was a particular ruptural period that you read only like five guys in Europe and only half of their work or something to, to get that story together. And then you, you attribute to it um, all the, all these other processes, you, you know, like, um, 
the, the rise of vaccination or something or, or the rise of public health or whatever things that, that Pinker thinks he can get out of it. Those guys didn't invent any of that stuff. And so, you know, like I'm not going to I think public health is an important, you know, uh, thing, but it's not like Diderot invented public health, and, and it's not like some particular intellectual style invented medicine. Uh, it's not even like vaccination was invented by enlighteners. It was, you know, we had it in China, uh, for example, earlier than we had it in the West, and uh, although it wasn't called vaccination, then it, it wasn't as well understood. Um, so I think the, the Enlightenment just turns to be exactly, as you said, a, a patting of ourselves on the back uh, by certain people who are trying to uh, articulate certain programs, and has a has a weird, it's like this weird mythic period that we really started fighting over in the 80s, and we started fighting over it in part because of mistranslations or, or at least uh, approximate translations of critiques of that period. So, you know, we brought in Foucault and then we thought that he was talking about the same period. Uh, we brought in uh, um, uh, even more particularly the Frankfurt School and, and Adorno and Horkheimer's dialectic of enlightenment, but they're not talking about the enlightenment. Their central enlightenment figures are just scientists. I mean, so they're having a conversation, you know, and, uh, um, and we could go more detail about that, but why those categories are distinct. So, um, for, for, for all those reasons, I'm critical of it. And, you know, um, yeah, that grand booster narrative where we pat ourselves on the back and are like, yeah, great. You know, we solved it. And, you know, this, this was these were the great, great men of history that made it possible. I'm, I'm totally not into that stuff. Yeah. But do you, do, I'm not sure there's ever been a historical period, though, where we haven't cherry picked, you know, as you, it made me made me smile when you said reading half of a philosopher's work of five different philosophers because that seems to me to be what philosophy, philosophy mostly is in the academy because when you you yeah. know especially i mean one clear example is nietzsche like the common popular ideal of nietzsche as a nihilist and then you go to read him and you're like wait where's this come from and that seems to be the process with every single philosopher is you have this sort of surface level almost meme of what each philosopher is and then when you finally go to read them you realize like you don't want to be that guy who says yeah but what about their later work you know where, where all, all the weird things that you're bringing in in this book which which philosophers touch on like like the example with you know when schopenhauer you could say oh schopenhauer is just the will and representation you say yeah but he also said that unless tele you know telepathy exists then there's no point to any of this and like there's this reluctance yeah. to even even admit to any of that so i mean is, I, I, mean, I, th I, guess think, a, yeah. I guess in a sense that then I'm just saying is history just a, is history just a long string of different contexts regulating themselves and cherry picking how they want to formulate themselves as being the best. Yeah, and I think I think that you're exactly uh, the way we put it is that history is a series of pe series of people projecting themselves backward on the past, and so we you know we often look for these progenitors. So we want to say like I don't know if you were whatever cool thing you th you know you're into whether you're i don't know, in a and this is going to date me. If you're in a dubstep, for example, you'll you'll just you'll you'll go back and you'll pick a particular source and you'll say that was the real original dubstep, and everything else, you know, like isn't the authentic thing. But often the figure that you'll hold up as the original dubstep didn't know they were doing dubstep, and you know, and or only half of their songs count as dubstep. Or I mean, I don't know why I'm using that example because the the one that I am more invested in is goth music. Like you could say uh, that um, you know. Uh, that the first goth band is Joy Division, but Joy Division didn't think of themselves as a goth band. They're emerging from the punk movement. They're a little bit sad. Some of their songs sound goth, but some of them really don't. You know, really the things that we think of as the defining tropes of goth music are, are a generation later. And they're in thick figures like Sisters of Mercy who are already like the imitation of what Susie and the Banshees and Joy Division and a bunch of other bands people haven't heard of, like, you know, um, are, we're into. And so we back project these ancestors. And so I think that we do that and we, we tend to, make a lot of mistakes when we don't realize that's what we're doing. And it turns out that things like the Enlightenment are back projected from the 50s or, or, or so, or, you know, as the period. And then, you know, but then we've inherited without realizing that our that our grandfathers were were um, inventing that earlier period. And then when we talk about our grandfathers or whatever, we will back project them too. We'll necessarily select some of their work and it'll be more about our current moment. And, and you can get versions of this story. I'm just telling you what uh, I'm, I'm repeating a, a little version of what Walter Benjamin describes in his thesis on, on, on history. And so, but, but I mean, you know, um, I, I don't claim novelty in that argument and you can find it in other places too. But, um, but I think the other piece of it, and this is what I also wanted to lift up is that there's something about the way that we do canonization of figures where we, it, it has an, um, you know, uh, an anthologizing quality to it. We lift up little pieces of them and then we assume that they all, you know, stick together in some way or another. And one of the things that I'm working on in the 
or I'm talking about in the book that comes after the myth book, which is a, a new book coming out in July uh, uh, called Metamodernism, Colon, the Future of Theory. I started that from trying to figure out how we stuck together a bunch of theorists and called them postmodernists. Like, mm. what was it about, you know, why did we think, you know, Derrida and Foucault kind of hated each other, uh, for a while, Bart was part. Roland Bart was part of a different conversation. Heidegger was a Nazi. Like, how did well, maybe we kind of? Well, how do we stick these all together and call them all postmodernists? And why do we only read little selections of their work? And how did we um, get the impression that they all had the same kind of project? And often, you know, the people who we call postmodernists, like Lyotard, were actually critiquing postmodernism. Anyway, so you could disentangle that. And so I was trying to figure out what caused that period to theory to gel together as a retroactive periodization. And why do we canonize the people that we did? And I don't want to say canonization is bad necessarily. Uh, I think it, in a way, it's inevitable. A lot of we can't, when we you know, the, the so-called postmodern critique of canon led to a new canon. Right now, we're, we're uh, you know, talking to undergraduates. There's a certain critique of canon uh, of that canon, but they're just inserting a different canon. I mean, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, and that's okay. It's going to be negotiated. Canon, I'm not attached to the, any particular old dead person. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm happy to keep, you know, refreshing the canon as needed. And, but I think that the idea that we'll ever escape canonization, um, is probably mistaken. We humans love to, to formulate our, our references textually, and we love to formulate our communities through anthology, at least since, you know, the rise of literacy is a mass phenomena. So, you know, it, it's going to be there. But I also think it's true, and I'll just add to this, and I, I can ramble a bit much, but your critique of philosophy, I think, is right in that um, in a lot of the academy, for some reason, and I don't know why, people are trained to read only, you know, the first part of some particular thinker as if that's the thinker. And so, you know, people, and, and this is true of even professionals. Like I've been in conferences where, like I, I was at a Max Weber conference in, in uh, Munich where, you know, Weber scholars are not all of them, but many of them. And I realized, you know, and I had a whole bunch of intellectual, I don't know, anxiety might be the word beforehand. And I went through, you know, I read everything Weber wrote, you know, I've read everything in English. And then I read almost everything I, that was relevant. I read it also in German so that I could make sure I had the language right. And, you know, it's full of this stuff. And I realized, it's okay, there are a bunch, several totally brilliant people there, but at least half the people presenting on the panels had only read the two or three most famous things of Weber and were basing their whole story of Weber, even publication after publication on little bits of his of his thought. And I thought, why is that? I mean, you know, why? I mean, I know that like Weber's writing on agrarian, you know, history of the agrarian state or whatever is super boring. But you'd think if you're going to call yourself a Weber scholar, you would just at least skim that stuff once, you know, like or, you know, but 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 for some reason, people don't tend to do that. And, and I and I'm not exactly sure why that is. So, you know, if I'm going to write I teach a course on Foucault or, or Nietzsche or Weber or whoever, I want to get really deep in and read. I'll read everything. even if I only give the students, you know, a little bit, um, you know, I, I, I think of it as a kind of intellectual due diligence. And I wish that, that we were encouraged to, 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 to marinate in, in certain thinkers in more detail uh, rather than just to, you know, I, 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 you know, snip, just snippets, you know, of different thinkers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's mad. I mean, I, you know, perhaps, there is some um, official definition of what a scholar is somewhere, but I, I always figured that a scholar should be someone who has at least once read everything of that person. You know, there might be some letters strewn around which they couldn't get their hands on, but I mean, yeah. published text, at least you should have read them all. I mean, I, I can't, but that that's crazy. But I mean, thinking back to the idea of canonization, because I think what you've sort of explained there in terms of canonization, I'm now really looking forward to this book that you're going to publish, is really in terms of what this podcast, you could now, I could probably aptly describe it as an anti-canon podcast because i mean this and it also plays into that idea of myths that we sort of abide by and perhaps canonization is in terms of what we understand modern to be it abides by that same myth of progress right that like that idea of like you have a then b then c then d and we go from the start to the finish and it all fits neatly like you know and i mean one there is examples of this of course you think about german idealists like kant through to you know Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, blah, blah, blah. Like, they, they all yeah. are saying, like, yeah, we are dealing specifically with this. And I think that's fine to say, yeah, this is German idealism. It's fine. But, like, sort of, as you say, tying philosophers together, sometimes you're working on something, you go, I don't really think this person is, you know, in the, in the same vein. And it, I think maybe, maybe that's a modern ideal that you, it's very difficult for us to say, like, no, no, this isn't, this guy just wrote some stuff. It's not connected. Like it doesn't all have to tie in to some like brilliant end goal of philosophy. 
you know and i sometimes feel that way about schopenhauer like he almost seems to even though he is directly in relationship to kant there's such a difference i think is this even the same thing anymore like there's a real split between schopenhauer and german idealists yeah, and I think I think you're 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 right that there you know there, you get clusters of philosophical conversation where a bunch of people are commenting on each other like you know early German idealists or something, but often uh, what you get in anthologized textbooks is you want a nature of progress and so you have to have you have to assume that they're talking on the same theme and that the knowledge is growing. That's part of like some weird idea about how we teach undergraduates that you know not just undergraduates but you know ourselves within our discipline. Oh, this is what we figured out as philosophers after you know. But we're you know in a way you could argue we haven't made any progress in Socrates who was basically an anti philosopher and said the whole gig was up at the very beginning. Um, but also there's a tendency not just in philosophy but in academic disciplines in general to tell Pat narratives and we either like the narrative of progress or we like the narrative of split splits where you you bought you split a field into binaries so you say they're the realists and the anti-realists or they're people who are for agency or against agency or they're the modernists and the postmodernists and then we try and divide it up on a clean line and then we usually present ourselves as anthologizers as if we've transcended that 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 binary but like by implication by by anthology so we're like oh you know clearly the realists you know so we get an exaggerated realist on one side an exaggerated anti-realist on the other and then we say ah uh, uh, by implication the answer somewhere in the middle. I'm not going to work out the details. And then, you know, we're teaching the undergraduates and the undergraduates pat themselves on the back. You know, we ask them to divide in groups. Are you a realist or an anti-realist and whatever. Almost all that is bullshit. And, and I think it's, it's, I can see why um, people do it uh, as pedagogical strategies, but, and it, and it has a, but it has a huge, it's a hugely distorting phenomena and it has lasting implications, not just for undergraduates, but for people who become scholars in the field. So, I mean, this is, again, I'll, I'll attribute my insight. One of the, there's a key paragraph in Thomas Kuhn's, uh, The Structure of Scientific Relations, where he um, mentions uh, the fact that his, his paradigm of a paradigm is a textbook, basically. And one of the, th and, and he, it's just a short little passage, but it struck me when I read it a few years ago, I, I, exactly right, that what happens is, we anthologize things. We produce canons. We teach them to scholars, whether they're undergraduates or grad, you know, postgraduates or you know, whatever. Um, and then people internalize those, and then they may learn that they're individual thinker that they really want to specialize in is an exception. They learn that the you know the anthologized Descartes is a skeptic. They decide to become Cartesian scholars, and then the first thing they always tell you at any book by a Descartes, De, a Cartesian scholar in the first page is like Descartes was not a skeptic, and that becomes an inside thing that all Cartesian specialists know, but everybody else somehow it doesn't filter back in the field. But you know, but it leads this huge imp impact on the field because even if they become Descartes specialists and they, and they know he's not a skeptic, they still have a weird false idea of whatever the next, you know, Spinoza and what his project was or something, you know, and so you know, th that, that continual pattern reproduces itself. And I don't know why we're not a little more humble in the way we present our textbook materials and why we don't own the limits of the anthologizing process itself. And, and I try and do it when I'm teaching. I'm saying, you know, you know, the, I try and do a lot more due diligence than I think many of my peers do in terms of reading uh, individual thinkers. I have the advantage that I read very quickly. Um, but I also, when I'm presenting with students, I tell them, you know, here I'm fitting this into the schema, but here are the ways it doesn't fit the schema. So, you know, just so that you know, we're reading the beginning of Descartes because I want you to worry about you know, his early meditations and worry about whether the external world exists. But I'm going to tell you at the outset that actually he doesn't end there. He wants to build the whole thing of the world, you know, and certain knowledge and this, all this other thing that we're not going to talk about in class because you're not going to find it plausible. But I want you to know that it's there so that you don't get the mistaken idea. You don't walk home from it thinking, wow, Cartesian skepticism, that was all Descartes thought or whatever. No, that's a preparatory exercise. Let's just for him and, and for you, you know, so that's what I say to my undergrads and then we roll forward. I know you know, and I'm not saying that I'm not unique in teaching a certain kind of intellectual humility, but I try to, and I and I try and embody it too. In that, you know, and, and I tell students, hey, you know, if the things that I'm telling you about a particular thinker that don't fit your reading, tell me, and and I may learn from it. You know, and sometimes students will catch things. They'll be like, oh, you're saying this about him, but look, I can't, found this footnote, and Foucault's saying the opposite, and then I'm like, oh, okay, good. You know, I grow that way. You know, so anyway, uh, I guess that's another part of one of the things I want to encourage, which is a kind of intellectual humility. Um, yeah. Yeah. I often feel that way about like penguin penguin classics and like Bloomsbury revelations, right? They have the they're so big, they have the power. Like these are the revelationary texts. Like says who? Who like agree? Yeah. Well, you know, there's some committee somewhere that says, "Yep, that was a revelation." But it's like <laughs> in what context? So then you end up with this series, and then 
it does it does some strange things to your you know your psychology because it's included in this text you suddenly like agree like oh even though i haven't read it that must be important and i think you know perhaps that's more of a comment on like good book design when it's done well by a professional company you think well it must be an important text so yeah yeah there you go but i mean in what sense does this sort of cherry picking of history play into be, becoming disenchanted because i mean that brings about questions of what it what enchantment actually means because i think you think of enchantment you think not to sound too cliche but you do think of like fairies and the mystical and like um what's that what's the genre that salman rushdie writes Mystical, magical realism magical maybe realism. i don't know yeah magical yeah. realism like a world where you know you turn a corner and it isn't just a sterile backdrop of an urban city but there's there's things creeping out from behind the bins or you know something strange is going on i mean maybe maybe i'm completely off the mark here but that that sense that there's there's more behind the world than there actually is and there is an enchantment to it and it's not just the the reality you're you're given in, you know in that sense then can you could we actually have different forms of enchantment in which the context that we're given in the texts that, w- that are canonized and the philosophy that we are sort of presented, each of these could be sculpted in a way to give us a different type of enchantment or even a different type of disenchantment. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, and I and I like something that I almost thought you were going to say <laughs> earlier in our conversation about anthologies, which is it would be great to do, like if, if you ever connect with a publisher and, and you want to co-do this, I'd happily do this with you, um, an anthology of the mystical writings of the canon that are, we'd never read. Like what if we just read, you know, Schopenhauer's magic and, you know, Freud's telepathy and all those things. Like what if we just took those pieces and, you know, I mean, that would have all the flaws that it would over-present uh, certain things and under-present others and whatever, but it would be a fun exercise exercise because you could do that or you we could you could also do um, you know, a canon of the excluded, which it sounds like what you're doing in this podcast, which is to say there are a lot of people who were incredibly influential in their own period, but we've f- for some reason forgotten retroactively, right? Like, you know, I mean, you know, and, and that's not just true of, of occult thinkers. I mean, you know, there were, you know, the best selling novels in 1940 or whatever that we no longer read. Like I, I went maybe about five or six years ago, I had a summer where I thought I'm going to go year by year and figure out you know, what was the best selling author. I started from 1900. Um, I think I made it maybe like 15 years in or something. What was the best selling book that year? And have I read it? You know, uh, and I was looking at, I think, um, I think it was maybe New York times. Or something. It was an American list and I hadn't heard any of them. Like, I mean, I'm just like going through and I'm like, what was, and often like, I, I only think I maybe did about 15 because most of them just didn't speak to me. And I think maybe that's part of why, you know, but I found some gems, you know, some weird things, totally bizarre stuff. But like, you know, w- there was like a, a really major book, weird major sort of surrealist books coming out in the early 20th century that were mainstream bestsellers and that nobody reads anymore. Like, and they just don't make any account. You have to get these out of print books, you know, or, or get them on, you know, on your Kindle or whatever, you know, or, or, or the, or the analog. Um, so I think it's true that we don't have a good sense of the past based on this extractive phenomena of, of anthologizing in particular way that we do. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the reason that things speak to certain moments and not others um i think i've lost the thread of where you were at, we were we were going with this one um the, the sort of the sculpting of a personal environment yeah. of a context in time yeah so i think also the other thing is that um for as many people well there have been some people who uh I advocated for a stark and austere materialism. They've actually been in the major- minority, not the majority. And so even though, but, but I think you're right that then the alternative responses to that stark materialism have been a plethora and they've changed over time. So for some people, you know, they, you know, you know, spiritualism is, is, that was the thing for them. Or for some people it was, um, but for some people it was, you know, religions of science that like, you know, one of the things that I've recently written uh, that's not in my new book, but it's coming out in articles about the history of monist leagues, which were this uh, started in Germany, but became this pan-European movement um, uh, for like religions of science where they were trying to like, they made like churches with like um, a jellyfish on the walls and wanted people to kind of get in touch with nature. And the weird thing is that it was often promoted by a, a group of like Nobel prize winning scientists as an alternative to religion, uh, as a religion that was itself an alternative to religion and it, and, and a kind of pantheism. It was often, it was, you know, uh, so 
th- th- those things are there, but you know that's a particular historical phenomena. That's a particular way of dealing with the world. Uh, but that isn't, you know, that was historically determined. You know, then after the fifties, you know, we have different kinds of new age, or we have you know, aliens and people into UFO belief, or we have, I don't know, there's a constant proliferation of new belief systems and new ways of thinking about the world um, with some overlap and some continuity. But um, yeah, but I think that there are many, you know, and, and there are is a minority of people who have, who have been okay with thinking of the world just in terms of mere stripped down mechanism. But, but I think they've had a disproportionate impact in certain parts of the academy and in certain parts of the culture. Um, and, and rather it's the plurality that's the real thing that caught you know the, the, that's more um widespread and conflicts between different incompatible uh enchantments rather than between enchantment and disenchantment let's say uh so you know the evangelicals who are really were really central to to the death of spiritualism by arguing that spiritualist spirits were just demons you know they hugely contributed to the to the shedding of spiritualism as a cross-cultural phenomena um you know they were in competition you know with each other for example and so you know you see those things happening uh together or you know the u.s government had its own psychical research program called the the stargate project and it and, and although i'm still gathering details from this so let's say it my sense from beginning to look at some of the archive work is that it got killed actually by somebody who was uh, an evangelical Christian for more for, for that as much as anything else. Um, also, because it seemed kind of embarrassing to some people at that particular historic moment. It was, um, you know, when it became public budget item, but it, but it was more Christian opposition to psychical research than it seems. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. I need to do more research. But then, than anything else that contributed to, to the loss of that as a, as a U.S. government research area. So uh, rather than its failures in other respects. So, you know, we see... Um, yeah, I know. So I think w- the period of time that we often describe as modernity, but let's say the the 20th century and, and the 21st century has been a proliferation of different kinds of beliefs. Uh, and and um, and some of those, it's true, have taken less institutional forms. So, you know, we have a, a recent study that just came out in the last week about the U.S. noted that people's church attendance is down. But church attendance is a really bad correlation with the kinds of beliefs that, you know, people actually have anyway. So, you know, more people believe in angels than believe in God. God. I mean, that's an interesting, you know, and in, 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 for example, in, I think in Great Britain and much of the Western world, that's interesting. What, what are those believers and how do they fit it together? Like, that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. Yeah, that proliferation of belief. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've sort of veered into the, the meta narrative, as you said. So we've sort of veered yeah. away from the book, but I think it all relates back to the book. I mean, is there anything you, th- you think key that we've missed in terms of, you know, the tangents that are, the book are taking that we've sort of uh, gone past? Um, I think, you know, for, for, for listeners of your podcast, you know, just to, to recap. So The Myth of Disenchantment is mostly uh, a book about how we got the idea that modernity meant an end of belief in enchantment, uh, magic or myth, and how the very theorists of that had enchanted beliefs in their lives. So like, uh, you know, uh, as you're saying, we could have captured any philosopher and found their enchanted belief. The interesting thing for me is that the people who theorized disenchantment themselves often had enchanted beliefs. And, you know, so so that very narrative of modernities and disenchantment, we have to read it was, it was often melancholy or, you know, was often uh, provided by people who aimed to supply the missing magic. And so, you know, some of the main people who promoted the idea that magic was lost in modernity were not just academics, but practicing magicians like, you know, Crowley or like uh, Helena Blavatsky, both of whom had disenchantment narratives and were some of the most influential occultists of the of the uh, 20th century. So or 19th and 20th century. Um, so. Uh, that's, I think, a good part of that book. It's, it's otherwise a little bit dry history. So that's the only thing that I, that I, you know, uh, I, I would tell your your po- your podcast listeners, um, depending on what what they're in the mood for. I thought you know it could make a even fun a fun more popularized shorter version of it with less footnotes. You know, maybe that will come out someday. Uh, 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 but. Uh, yeah, uh, that's the. Uh, is there anything else I want to say about the project? And for for those of you who are philosophy listeners in this podcast, which I know you get also, the book is primarily a response to uh, Porkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment and the work that I'm dovetailing, that I'm that I'm um, sort of producing the counterpoint to, is their book. And so that's what gave me working backward from their text is how I assembled many of the theorists that I that are there. I say that at one point in the beginning, but people seem to have missed that in the, some of the p- reviews of it. It's it's my attempt to respond to that, and a working title of it, although uh, uh, you know, it was originally um, a di- dialectic of myth, but you know, the word dialectic 
people, you know, the people were running it as dialect. And then, you know, it just it was a mess. And anyway, that sounded too um, uh, Hegelian or, 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 or something like that. But, but, but for ph philosopher readers, in a way, this is a long form engagement or departure from um, Horkheimer and Adorno and showing the limitations of their project. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And what is it you're working on at the moment? Well, so the new book that's coming out in July uh, is called Metamodernism, uh, the, the, um, the Future of Theory. It was originally the Future of Theory after postmodernism, but I cut the, we, we cut that little bit off the end. Um, it's a break for me because it's an attempt to do first to historicize what was postmodernism uh, in the academy. And then it's a big break because I'm mostly trying to do a positive project. After doing that, I say, what should basically philosophy of social science look like going forward? How can we consolidate the best bits of what we call the postmodernism and modernism and then move forward? And so it's a little bit of a, it has a little bit of a utopian edge to it in that I'm saying, here's what we should do, not just me being a historian and describing where we have been. Um, that's the thing that's coming out next, um, but I'm right now writing a book on power. Uh, that's the next thing. I'm trying to re-theorize power. I noted that in the humanities and social sciences, we keep having all of our theories, I'll, I'll use a little jargon here, terminate into ontologies of power. We want to say uh, that, you know, language boils down to power, ethics boils down to power, uh, you know, social structure boils down to power, uh, human social formation boils down to power, religion is nothing but power, politics is nothing but power, etc. But we haven't had a significant update up to our theory of power since Foucault. And there are some fundamental flaws with Foucault's particular narrative uh, and intellectual trajectory. And we, we're, we're like kind of vulgar Foucauldians. In other words, we're, we have a, in many of the, the academic disciplines, we have what we think Foucault argued, but, he, but again, with our, when you read all Foucault, it's not exactly what he argued, but I don't know that what he actually argued is any better uh, version of power. And so what I want to do in that project is move forward and provide a, a fresh theory of power that'll let us do a different kind of work, more nuanced, work, a kind of Foucault promised at one point in his early work, a microphysics of power, didn't quite deliver on that. I want to kind of deliver on that project in, in a particular way. Um, and so that's what I'm writing right now. Wow. Lots, lots going on. That's good. So when's the, so the power one should be coming out first? No, the metamodernism one first. Okay. So that'll come out uh, July. And then the power one is, a, is farther out because academic publishing is glacial. Like I, I write a book, then it goes through peer review. It, for some reason, it seems to take typically a year to give me peer review feedback. And then after I get that back, I usually have three months to make the reviews. And then it comes out a year after that. So mm -hmm. everything is always, you know, like by the time when I finish a book, it's usually two years before when I think I'm finished, it's usually two years before it's actually done. And I'm not quite done with the power book. So figure it's about three years from now, two to three years from now, that'll come out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there anything you'd, you'd like to add about the book? And uh, I'm assuming we can sort of find it on all good bookstores. Yeah, so uh, you can find the so you can find the myth of disenchantment in yeah all good bookstores. I have an earlier book. My first book is the invention of religion in Japan. That one might be appealing for people interested in East Asian thought and um, philosophical debates around what is religion, what is science. Um, and then the metamodernism book. It's coming out in July. They're all University of Chicago Press. Uh, you can find them either on the University Press website or wherever you order your books online. You can also find me on Twitter, uh, although I barely tweet. Uh, I do it so occasionally, you know, kind of. Uh, um, uh, but you can find me there. Uh, and I also have a blog that I've been, uh, been really shitty about, but uh, called AbsoluteDisruption.com. I became a dad, and when I, be, you know, and I stopped blogging. But I, I want to go back to as, as soon as my daughters are just a little older, I'll go back to blogging again too. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I think that's a good place to finish up. Uh, yeah, Jason Joseph Storm, thanks very much. Thank you. My pleasure.